to be scared. You know, we've had these uh, haunted houses and everything around here with uh, Halloween and all that, but I, I, I'm pretty sure nothing scares like the book of Revelation. So uh, if you want to thrill, here you go. We are going to look today at the judgments in the book of Revelation. There are, uh, if you've read the book of Revelation, you may be familiar with or you've studied it, there are three sets of judgments found in the book of Revelation. The first set is the, do you guys know? The seals, yes. And how many of those seals are there? Seven. And then there's another set of judgments. Do you know what that other set is? Trumpets. Dave, you can't look at the board. And how many of the trumpets, Dave? Seven. And then there's another set of judgments. And what are those judgments? Bowls. And how many, Robert? There's seven. (laughs) Man, you guys are ahead of the class. Yes, yes. So we'll get a couple uh, preliminary thoughts out of the way here in a moment. And then we'll go through and we'll look at each one of these. This is meant to be more of a survey, not a full-blown, in-depth um, uh, study of each one. So let's, let's pray and then we'll jump in. Heavenly Father, with the word open before us, uh, and as we are gathered, we pray that your spirit would lead us to understand the things that have been written. We know, according to the very beginning of the book of Revelation, that these things are written that we might be encouraged and have hope and be blessed. And so, God, I pray uh, that the things we see, what you have planned for this world, God, they would indeed give us great hope. They would give us hope that you are a God who is just and your your judgments are right and true that you are a God who is in control when everything else in this world seems to be in complete upheaval. And that, Lord, you will indeed uh, bring the evil to account and bring the just, uh, Lord, to reward. You will do these things and you will accomplish all your purposes that you have planned and no man and no angel will thwart them. Uh, Help us to see, God, that you are the sovereign ruler over the heavens and the earth. Help us to see, Father, that your promises stand firm and that there's not one who belongs to you who will be lost. And so, God, today, encourage our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. So, first of all, all 21 of these judgments are God's judgments. What we see from uh, chapter 6 through chapter 19 is that God is the one who on his throne is executing these divine judgments. Specifically, who is the one who's executing these? You guys remember? You guys know, remember? Take a guess. You only got three to choose from. We believe in a trinity, so there's one of three. Starts with an L, ends with an AM. The Lamb, yeah, 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 that was a good one, right? The lamb, right? Because you remember in chapter 5, what happened was is that no one could be found who was able to take the scroll from the one who sat on the throne's right hand. And then all of a sudden there was the lamb who had been slain, standing victoriously, right? And he was worthy to take the scroll. So he took the scroll, he sat down, and he begins one by one to break the seals. And then all of the upheaval, all of the catastrophes, all of the judgments begin Uh, that we see in the book of Revelation. Um, So what I want us to see, so first of all, is that these are God's judgments. These are his wrath. These are his um, retribution, his divine justice being unleashed on the world. And these sets of judgments occur in what time period have we been looking a lot at in the last months? What time period? What end time time period? Tribulation. Tribulation, which is how long of a period of time? Seven years. years. Yes. So this last seven year period is going to be characterized by a lot of upheaval, a lot of upheaval. And you can, if you can imagine this blue line simply being the seven year period, we just put the seals, trumpets, and bulls. These are not exact as far as timing. 
I know some commentators have it dialed down to the hour and the minute of each day. I think that's probably a little too confident. But we just know that these seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls are going to take place in the uh, tribulation period, the seven-year tribulation period. The second thing that I would um, argue is that these judgments, all of them, they are sequential. They're not simultaneous. There are some interpreters who see these, uh, it's called uh, recapitulation, where the seven seals are actually concurrent with the seven trumpets and actually are concurrent with the seven bulls, and they just all sort of, at the same time, all three of those sets of judgments take place. I don't think that's really the way the scriptures read. I think when we read it, we'll see that you have one and then two, and then three, and John keeps saying things like, and then I saw a white horse, and then I saw a red horse, and then I saw a black horse, and then I saw, after that, a pale horse, and then after that, I saw the altar with the souls underneath, and then after that, I saw the cosmic signs. You know, so it's just this after. It's, it's, uh, whenever you study the Bible, one of the things that you look for when you study the Bible is you look for um, indicators of time, indicators of sequence or progression. Are there words like, afterwards and then, right, beforehand, right, that indicates something happens prior to or after or at the same time of. You look for those, that kind of language, and you see that the book of Revelation, that the language that John uses in describing the seals, the trumpets, and the bulls, it's all sequential language. And then I saw, and after that, I saw, right? And so you'll see that with all seven seals, all seven trumpets, and then all seven bowls. We'll see that as we go through. Maybe a good way to describe it. I used this illustration like three years ago when, I, when we did this study, or four years ago when we did this study. I thought it was like the awesomest illustration ever. I have no idea why a commentator has not stolen it and put it in his book. But imagine you have, imagine you have seven gift boxes, right? Seven presents wrapped. And you open the first one, second one, third one. You get down to the seventh one, you open the seventh gift box, right? You unwrap it and everything, rip the ribbon off. You take the top off and you pull it out and there's seven gift bags. So you take those seven gift bags out, you line them up, one through seven. You pull the gifts out of each one of the seven. You get to the seventh one and you, pull, and you look into the seventh gift bag and there's seven gift cards, right? And then you pull those seven gift cards out and then you go through and you spend them like crazy. Okay, so... Do you see the idea? Yeah, isn't that awesome? Isn't that like the coolest illustration to describe the sets of judgments that you've ever heard? That was super good. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. Someone gets it, right? But see, what I'm saying is, is here is when you get to seal seven, that, that begins the seven trumpets. In a way, you might be able to say that the seven trumpets are part of the seventh seal. When you get to the seventh trumpet, you have then, right afterwards, the seven bowls that begin. So in a way, you could maybe make the point that the seven bowls are part of the seventh trumpet. So just some ways of thinking about it, but it's chronological, it's sequential, it's really not simultaneous. I think that's a bad argument. So, you guys wanna get into it? The chapters that we're gonna look at, okay? So as you look, uh, chapter six, chapter eight, chapter nine, chapter 11, chapter 15, but specifically 16, are specifically the chapters that describe these judgments. So let's look at Revelation 6, and let's begin looking at the seal judgments. Now remember, all of heaven is around the throne of God right now. They're crying out and shouting out and singing the praises of the Lamb and the one who sits on the throne. The 24 elders are bowed down, and all of a sudden the Lamb takes that scroll that he took out of God's right hand, and he begins to break these seals. So chapter 6, verse 1. I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, Come! I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror, bent on conquest. All right, so we see a white horse. We see a rider on that horse who's going to go out and who's going to conquer. He's going to be bent on conquest, right? So we're going to see that. Then, chapter, uh, verse 3, when the lamb opened the second seal, <clears throat> I heard the second living creature say, come. Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other. 
To him was given a large sword. Verse 5, when the lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, come. I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. Then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, two pounds of wheat for a day's wages and six pounds of barley for a day's wages, and do not damage the oil and the wine. When the lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, come. I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death and Hades, or excuse me, its rider was named Death, and Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and the wild beasts of the earth. Let me pause right there a second. So we've gone through four of the seven seals. Now, who is it that is calling forth these riders? Did you notice? What's the pattern there? So the lamb breaks the seal, and then upon breaking a seal, one of the four living creatures around the throne calls out, come. And each one of those four living creatures call forth one of the four horses and riders on those horses. You remember those four living creatures are described in chapter four. They've got wings, you know, they've got four different faces, and they're just majestic and incredible, and they cry out day and night, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And uh, to him who was and who is to come. So they're... Uh, there's some magnificent creatures, and so each one of those four call forth the four horses, and then we see a little bit of a switch. So the pattern is horses, but the last three uh, seals are going to describe something different. So look at verse 9. When he, that is the lamb, opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just as they had been. So, who is under this altar? Martyrs. Avenge our blood, right? They had been killed. Why were they killed? Because of Jesus Christ, right? And they, because what does it say? Uh, uh, Verse 9 says, because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. So they had a choice. You either renounce Christ and live or You maintain the testimony of Jesus Christ and die. And they died. Now, what does it say? It says, I saw under the altar the souls, which is interesting. It makes makes you wonder, are they discarnate? Like they have no physical body there, it's just their souls. And then they're given white robes. Like if they're, I mean, I don't mean to be, if they're like ghosts, you know, they just like throw a robe on them. Interesting. We're not going to get into all that. Well, this is a survey, you guys. We're not doing some deep dive verse by verse and looking at all the Greek and everything. Okay, so there we go. They've got to wait. So that's an interesting seal. The seal is not really like a, a, a the seal's not a judgment. It's almost like he gets a sneak peek under the altar to see the martyrs that are being killed by the godless on earth, the inhabitants of the earth, the earth dwellers, depending on the translation that you use. And, and those, God says, are going to be joined by more until the full number is reached. There's going to be a lot of killing of those who hold the testimony of Jesus Christ during the tribulation. And then if you look at the next verse, it says, I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red. And the stars in the sky fell to earth as figs dropped from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The heavens receded like a scroll being being rolled up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains 
And they called to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who can withstand it? Now, that's an interesting one there, because it does seem, because it has a lot in common with Jesus' teaching in Matthew chapter 24, Luke chapter, uh, I think it's 21 or 17, one of those two, and then Mark 13, which is where he gives his Olivet Discourse. And you'll remember there that Jesus described right before he returns, those are the kinds of signs that would precede his coming. The sun would go dark, stars would fall to the sky, earthquakes, those sorts of things. And so you're looking at here, this is being described in the sixth seal. And one of the difficulties of interpreting the book of Revelation and putting a timeline together is you're like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We still got all this. You know, we still got all that. How can this describe the very end? Well, there's a couple different proposals, proposed ideas. One is, is that things begin to happen because of seal six that continue to happen and have an effect all the way to the end, and that seal six's events don't happen like in an, a very isolated moment in the tribulation, but they can be events that happen all throughout the rest of the tribulation. That's one. Um, another theory is, what is another theory? I'll remember it when I come back to it. <laughs> you're like, you're supposed to know this. I know. Okay, so there's the first six seals. You'll notice that the chapter ends without getting to the seventh seal. And then we get to chapter seven, and chapter 7 is that famous passage, we were looking at it last week, where it describes the 144,000 Jews who will be, say, who will be uh, uh, sealed. And then we also see in the last half of that chapter the description of the multitude of Gentiles, okay? The multitude of Gentiles who are redeemed. So there's a pause, there's a break in the description of the seal judgments and right here, before getting to the seventh seal, there's this interlude. And you'll see this as you go through and you read these. It doesn't just like in three chapters run right through all these, all these judgments. You know, we're going to get into chapter eight now, and that's going to pick up the first uh, four trumpets and the seventh seal. And then chapter nine is going to be uh, trumpet five and six. And then, uh, uh, no, trumpet five and six are going to be in chapters, what is it, I think it's 11? We'll get there. We're working our way there. Oh, I have it written over here. There's a lot of information up here. Mike. No. Can I explain it to you? Um, because if I'm convinced going into chapter seven, of a pre-trib rapture, then it would seem to exclude that group from being the church because it says they came out of the great tribulation, which would indicate that they perhaps were martyred or killed in some way, um, but probably martyred might be the way to, maybe they're part of the uh, fifth seal, the altars under the soul, or, under, or the, <laughs> the souls under the altar, maybe that's, they make up part of that population. But if I'm already convinced of, say, of like a pre-trib rapture, then I would say that group seems to be a group that's coming out of the great tribulation, or uh, out of the seven-year tribulation period, which the church wouldn't be there for that, if I'm convinced of a pre-trib rapture. Now, if I'm not convinced of a pre-trib rapture, let's say I believe in a mid or a pre-wrath or I'm, I'm, I'm post-trib, then, well, not post-trib, a mid or a pre-wrath position, which believes, just for clarification, a mid-trib mid rapture believes halfway through the tribulation you're going to be wrapped, the church will be raptured out. Pre-wrath believes that somewhere in about three-quarters, four-fifths of the way through the tribulation, the church will be raptured out. Um, then I would probably be more open to the idea that that group represents the church. So those would be the different views, but since I'm convinced of a pre-trib rapture, I interpret it differently than being the church. I would just interpret it as Gentiles from nations around the world who would make up the sheep that uh, 
that, uh, is gonna be, that are going to be before the judgment of Jesus at the end of the tribulation who will enter the kingdom. That's the way I would interpret it. That confuse everybody? <laughs> it's a lot of information thrown. I don't know if that answers your question or satisfies you, but that's why I would not interpret it as the church. Okay? But I can see why someone would if they don't believe in a pre-trib rapture because they think the church will go into the tribulation. So that's how, that's how I would approach that. What's that? Yes, that's, that's what I'm saying where that's why I believe these are all the Gentiles that are going to die in the Great Tribulation. And if I want to be real technical about it, that would put it in the last half. These are all the Gentiles that will die in the last half of the Tribulation because this is technically called the Great Tribulation, whereas we would refer to the whole seven years as the Tribulation. But the great tribulation, the real, real, real bad stuff, all the real, real bad stuff is really piling up in the last three and a half years of that. So but that, that's why, that's why. If it, just, if it didn't say they came out of there, I'd be like, oh my goodness, it must be a snapshot of the church. But since it says they came out of the great tribulation, I'm interpreting that as a different group than the church. Yeah, yeah, they would be, yeah, because they held, because, what does it say there? It says that they, they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb, which is another phrase for, I mean, they, they believed in Christ and they held to the testimony of Christ. Like the souls under the altar where they maintained their testimony about Christ and they died for it. So they're believers in Jesus Christ. There is, remember, preaching of the kingdom of God going on during the tribulation. Yes, that's my interpretation. Because, again, if you start with everyone who... I'll get to you one second, buddy. But you know what? You probably got it. Go for it. No, no, I, I was... Is it fair to say that with a, a pre-tribulation rapture view, that between us being raptured as a church and then the tribulation to follow, and then there is this great multitude that we can expect widespread revival to break out during the midst of all these things going on? Yes. So while all these catastrophic judgments are going on, there also is simultaneously a great revival going on. So while there's great persecution, there's great thriving of the church, prospering of the church. What did, what did it say in Acts chapter 8 when Saul began to persecute the church, right? Trying to stomp it out. What happened? As they spread, so did the number of believers grow and increase as they, as they escaped Judea. So the church grew and spread. Now... Um, Yes. So that could be distribution. Yes, that's what, that's, what I, that's what I interpret as right there, is they are coming, pre-trib rapture says anybody and everybody who truly believes, not just attends church, but who truly believes and has the spirit of God inside of them, right? They put their faith in Christ for their salvation. Every single one of those people will be raptured off the earth so that there will be immediately after the rapture not a single person on the planet who believes. Because everybody who believes is what? Right. So nobody believes. Then, if nobody believes, okay, anybody who does believe that is being described that way in chapter 7 of Revelation here came to faith in the tribulation after the rapture. That's the pre-trib rapture interpretation, okay? So everybody, well, why would they come to faith? The church is gone. Well, God will make a way, all right? <laughs> if they refuse to, the rocks will cry out, okay? So God's going to make it happen, but there is going to be preaching of the kingdom. What did Jesus say in the Olivet Discourse? He says, and these things will continue, and the preaching of the kingdom of God will continue around the entire world, and then the end will come, okay? 
So the preaching of the kingdom of God is going to happen. And we see that. We actually see in a few chapters later, I can't remember if it's, is it 16? Is it, I think it's 16, where the, there's three angels that fly through the air and they preach. And you're like, you got angels preaching? <laughs> this is just, this is wild. Yes, imagine if you've heard. Yeah. Yeah, so if the rapture happens, people who've heard the gospel will remain on the earth. People who heard it but didn't believe it. Now, there is hope for them because they can then at that point believe, but there is something in Revelation that tells us that if they do this certain act, they will never be redeemed. Do you know what that act is? They take the mark of the beast. There's not one person who takes the mark of the beast who will be, who will be redeemed. It's very possible, yes. And when, where are the two come from? Also? Oh, you want to get into like the next week or the week after study, <laughs> Gerard? Every time, Gerard, you're trying to fast forward this class. Where do they fit in? That's a great, that's a great debate. Like, does their career start in the middle and end at the end of the tribulation? Does it start at the beginning? and end at the middle of the tribulation? That's my view, but I'm open to others. Does it start, you know, anywhere else and end anywhere else? I think they start at the beginning and they end at the middle. They're raptured up to heaven at the middle of the tribulation. We'll get there, though. Gerard. It's like he's pushing me in my back. Go, get there. Um, what are we studying? Where are we? Seven seals. Okay, so skip over chapter 7. Go to chapter 8, and chapter 8 begins, when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. <laughs> I'm, like, that is... I'm like, hey, look, I got seven kids. That sounds magnificent. <laughs> that sounds magnificent. Yo. <laughs> Man. <laughs> Mike Brooks, didn't you have a question? I'll take your question. I'll take your question, Mike. <laughs> Kathleen? Are you going to chapter 7? I would have to go and look at the context of Ezekiel because sword, famine, and plague have been used repeatedly in Israel's history as judgments. And that is something God uses not only against Israel but also other nations. Um, just be, you know, like, like God has used a lot of these judgments all throughout history. But in the end climactic judgment period of the tribulation, they're all coming together, you know. Um, but you're going to see how they progress to become more and more... Um, destructive, more and more creative, even. Like, wow. Okay, so, silence in heaven for about half an hour, and I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given them. So, after the silence in heaven, now seven angels step forward, they're given seven trumpets, and they're going to sound their trumpets, and each trumpet is going to bring another, a new judgment with each of those seven trumpets. And so you have the silence in heaven while you have all this chaos on earth. You have the silence that contrasts with the sound of the trumpets that's coming. So let's read through these. Um, so the trumpets. <coughs> he says, uh, where are we? oh, we got to get on to verse six because they have the really cool instance with the angel and the altar there. Then the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound them. Verse seven the first angel sounded his trumpet and there came hail and fire mixed with blood and it was hurled down on the earth. A third of the earth was burned up, a third of the trees were burned up and all the green grass was burned up. Wow, okay, 
So trumpet number one burns up a third of the earth. Then he goes on, verse 8. The second angel sounded his trumpet, and something like a huge mountain, all ablaze, was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea turned into blood, a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. What's that going to do to the economy? Right? Um, Verse 10. The third angel sounded his trumpet, and a great star blazing like a torch fell from the sky on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters turned bitter, and many people died from the waters that had become bitter. So the third trumpet, Wormwood, embitters the waters, makes them undrinkable. Verse 12, the fourth angel sounded his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck a third of the moon and a third of the stars, so that a third of them turned dark. A third of the day was without light and also a third of the night. Wow. Wow. So a third of the lights. So here again, like we see with the the seals, where after four of the seals, um, the pattern changed and there were some more, some unique judgments in the last three of them. Here, the first four, there's a little bit of a pattern going on here, but then it's going to change, and the last three are going to be very different from the first four. So look at uh, verse 13. He says this, As I watched, I heard an eagle that was flying in midair call out in a loud voice, Whoa, whoa, whoa. Three woes. Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the trumpet blasts about to be sounded by the other three angels. You're like, whoa. Well, whoa, yeah, literally. As if these weren't bad enough. They're like, you haven't seen anything yet. So let's keep reading. The fifth angel, chapter 9, sounded his trumpet and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. The star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. Do you remember what the abyss is? The abyss is where Satan is going to be locked for a thousand years. This is a place where demons abide, where they're imprisoned temporarily, and they'll be thrown ultimately into the lake of fire out of this abyss. It's an abyss that they can go into and be released from. The the demoniac that was inhabited by many demons in Mark chapter 5 cried to Jesus and said, please don't throw us in the abyss. Right? So it's a place of great torment and torture for demons. And so the abyss, uh, when he opened the abyss, smoke rose from it like the smoke from a gigantic furnace. The sun and sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss. And out of the smoke, locusts came down on the earth and were given power like that of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were not allowed to kill them, but only to torture them for five months. And the agony they suffered was like that of the sting of a scorpion when it strikes. During those days, people will seek death, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will elude them. I think these are actual creatures. People are like, oh, these are Apache helicopters. No, these are actual creatures. The abyss is a real place. Otherwise, if it's not, try and make sense of the demoniac in Mark 5. Try and make sense of where Satan's going to be. You start allegorizing and reinterpreting things into these wacko interpretations. Take them for what they are. It's an actual place. These are actual creatures. And if you can't believe that they look like the way it says they look here, how can you believe that the four living creatures around the throne of God look the way they're described? Or the seraphim in Isaiah 6 look the way they're described? Or in Ezekiel 1, the seraphim again, the way they, with the wheels, with all the eyes on it. Well, none of that's, that's just too fantastic. That's got to be, that's just got to be imagination and myth. Okay, whatever. There are, there's reality far beyond just what we see with ourselves right here. There are living, there are creatures radically different than us in the invisible spiritual realm that we have no idea, but they're being described to us. But watch this. Um, Where am I at? Here we go. Verse 7, the locusts look like horses prepared for battle on their heads, They wore something like crowns of gold, and their faces resembled human faces. Their hair was like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. 
They had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the thundering of many horses and chariots rushing into battle. They had tails with stingers like scorpions, and in their tails they had power to torment people for five months. They had as king over them the angel of the abyss, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek is Apollyon, that is destroyer. So this king demon is their king, ruling over them, leading them, coming up out of the abyss, and this whole army of demon locusts are going out and they are attacking men for five months and they are torturing men for five months who do not have the seal on their forehead and they will not die, but they will wish they could because of what they're going to do. Woe, number one. Woe, number one. Um, let's quickly read woe, number two. And then uh, we'll probably, my alarm will probably go off again. Oh my goodness, it's going to go off in one minute. The first woe was passed, the other two woes are yet to come. The sixth angel sounded his trumpet, and I heard, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> the sixth angel sounded his trumpet, and I heard a voice coming from the four horns of the golden altar that is before God. It said to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates, and the four angels who had been kept ready for this very hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of the mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000. I heard their number. The horses and riders I saw in my vision looked like this. Their breastplates were fiery red, dark blue, and yellow as sulfur. The heads of the horses resembled the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and sulfur. A third of mankind was killed by the three plagues of fire, smoke, and sulfur that came out of their mouths. The power of, the power of, where was it? Verse, the power of the horses was in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails were like snakes, having heads with which they inflict injury. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshiping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, idols that cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. So that is, gets us up to trumpet number six, ending chapter nine. That ends the second of three woes. We'll get into the last woe next time and the bull judgments next week. Um, but this, these are two of these divinely creative and destructive judgments that God is going to bring on the world. Fifth and sixth trumpets. Um, any questions? Fire away. <laughs> okay. That's a possibility, but I have a different explanation. So saints is a really universal word for people who are righteous. Could be the Old Testament, could be the church right now, could be believers in the tribulation. Jesus talks about that, specifically even Jewish believers. You could almost make that argument. Um, but remember in chapter 6, the souls of those under that altar. How long, O oh Lord? until you avenge our blood, right? And that angel comes up to that altar, and part of that incense is their prayers, whatever that means, you know what I mean, however that means. In response to their prayers, God is going to justly judge and bring judgment on the earth dwellers. And so that angel is a preliminary, effect, a preliminary priestly um, activity that he's doing right there, where he's taking that and he throws it onto the earth, and thunder and lightning and all that happens as a result.
the, mar- the martyred saints from the tribulation. Yeah, from the tribulation. Yeah. No, I think, I think the context is focusing on the, the people in the tribulation. So, like, the focus would not be, so, like, the church would be martyred, or, I'm sorry, the church would be raptured, so they'd be resurrected, even, and, and they'd be elsewhere, right? They wouldn't be under the altar. The souls, indicating people who had, been martyr, who, who had not been resurrected yet, and it indicates there that they are, waiting for more people in the tribulation to be martyred like they were, which strongly indicates they were martyred in the tribulation, okay? That's kind of how I would approach that. So I would say under the altar are gathering all the martyrs, and then they're praying, how long? Bring judgment, bring justice, right? Those psalms that are imprecatory psalms in the Old Testament, like break their teeth, break their arms, (laughs) you know? Who's prayed like that ever, right? (laughs) But they're praying that way, and then finally, you know, God's getting to it. He's answering their prayers with that. And that's just like a really, I don't know, I want to say it's just symbolic, but I think there's, it's a symbolic act of him answering God, their prayers. Jeff. You, you survive, if you survive past the sixth trumpet as an unbelieving, God-rejecting earth dweller, and you still don't repent, and you know God is the one doing this, let me ask you a question. What does that say? What does that say about the condition of your heart? <laughs> yeah. What, what a hard heart, right? How bent on rebellion are they? Even when God is just crushing them. We'll see when we get to uh, the, 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 this bowl judgment, the very last judgment. A hundred pound hailstone hurling down like a rainstorm of a hundred pound hailstones. Oh my goodness. Grace. There's a complete. Yes. That's true. That's true. And, and when, when the, the power of believing lies, the, the powerful delusion that God is going to send on them, 2 Thessalonians 2 says, because they refuse to repent, because they persist in all of those evil things that's, that are described, and they won't listen to preaching, they won't respond to the judgments of God that they know are happening because of God, God will send a delusion on them. So therefore, the the lies of demons, the lies of how many false Christs did Jesus say are going to be going on during the tribulation? When he talked in the Olivet Discourse, was it a couple? Were they just a few? No. How many? Many, 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 many false prophets false Christs are going to be going out into the world. There's going to be the most maximum amount of lying prophets from Satan, false Christ pretending to be Christ, deceiving and lying. And in the midst of all of that cacophony of wickedness and lies and deception going on, there will pierce through that the preaching of the 144,000, the preaching of anyone else who holds the testimony of Christ. When someone is about to have their head lopped off, which is going to happen in the tribulation, they'll say, do you recant and reject this Jesus? No. Whack! Right? And they'll do that thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of times to people. 
The testimony of Jesus will go out and be piercing through. They will reject it because they love evil. They hate righteousness. They love wickedness. It's what they love, and they won't turn from it. And they have all the lies in the world. Uh, they'll have, there, there, are, there, are, there are occult lies that talk about how Satan is the true, uh, as Lucifer, is the true light, is the true Christ, is the true good God, and justify Satan as being the one that is actually good, but Adonai is evil. Occult, um, secret um, organizations teach these things. Occult um, groups of all kinds of varying kinds teach that Satan, Lucifer, is the true light, but Adonai is the false light. Right? It's, 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 uh, it's some sick stuff out there. So they will believe these powerful delusions in these lies, and they will believe everything that's said to them. Gerard, I'll give you, uh, oh my goodness, it's late. You, you're quicker than I am. As believers, uh, when we come to Christ, we are given the Holy Spirit. Yes. And yes. And we choose how much we obey that. Right. The, will there be some, will there be spirits that possess people who take the mark of the beast and follow the Antichrist? I think you will see more of that than you see right now. I think there'd be more demonic possessions than there have ever been in human history during the tribulation. But there's not one spirit that can be everywhere all at once. That's a divine trait, right? So there may be individual demonic spirits and it just depends on the number of people who are worshiping compared to the number of demonic spirits available for that sort of job. So it may be a supply and demand issue. Um, Nancy, you get the last word, the last, last word. Like, how, right, right now, how close are we? We are one week closer than we were last week. <laughs> Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ that we are not condemned in our sins by you, the righteous and true judge, but you have declared us innocent and righteous in your sight. You have stripped our guilt away that we will not be judged and swept away with the evil of this world when your judgments come. But Lord, we have been delivered and are delivered into the hands of Jesus Christ and into his kingdom. Father, we put our hope in him and know that come what may in this world, your purposes stand firm. There is a kingdom that you will establish on this earth. Your son, your Christ will be established as king of kings and ruler of rulers and all the kings will bow down and will worship him and will kiss the son lest they be destroyed in their way. And Lord, righteousness will prevail. The peace of God will prevail over all the earth. Our hope, Lord, is in his coming and in his kingdom and in his kingship and Lord, for your purposes that are eternal. Thank you, God, for the believers here. Thank you for your word that we can study. In Jesus' name, amen.